Great. More yep. is better. Um, yeah, uh, please. Um, also, I, I'm very pleased to still be here in my office, but I'm really happy that you all came out virtually. Um, it's a it's a pleasure. It's also a compulsion, of course, for me to talk about research because it's exciting and I love doing it. And uh, some of it has indeed taken me to the Pacific on whose rim you live. And so there's gonna be hopefully something of relevance for uh, all of you. I uh, love questions. I like talking, but I like being interrupted even more. So if you have something that you want to say, please um, let me know, shout it. If I uh, don't get through the material that I normally would, then I'll skip to the end. I've got some points of exit built in there and some options. So I, I really wanna make it worth your, your time here. I'm unlikely to be able to monitor the chat and not lose my train of thought. So just you know, shout if you must. And yeah, if you keep your microphone off, we're gonna have a, a, a good time here. So I'll share my screen and go to full screen after which I'm going to see very few faces and focus on the one that keeps nodding. And I am hiding myself so I don't get distracted. And so if I get one thumbs up, I know that you're seeing a title that says 20,000 leagues under the sea with a fleet of seismic robots, which is the abridged version of the title I gave you. And I'm going to watch my time here at 2039. So, all right. Um, I have an alternative title with some themes here. And so I just wanna make sure that you hear those words and you see the three colors here. I will be talking about earthquakes. I may be talking about micro seisms, depending on how the time goes. And I would like to talk a little bit about volcanoes at the end because there's some exciting things that have happened lately. And I will be talking mostly about direct observations that we've made using this mobile hydrophone array, which I'll explain and which we've ultimately built, not just as an instrument, but also as a system, and then as a network, and as a global consortium, which is uh, so pleasant because it involves so many different people from so many different places. And I'm listing just a few here. Uh, Joel Simon is, is one of the most important ones um, in getting to the point that I'll be talking about because um, uh, he came in early as a grad student and he's now running our uh, network. Um, and he is uh, from Oregon. And uh, uh, Pete Pipat Pratanporn here is a current grad student who is, uh, uh, whose work I'll be sharing some of it in the second type of theme. And then there's various others, various others whose names I don't need to uh, read to you, but just so you all know, we never work alone but you knew that already. So in a few words, what all of us in geosciences are doing is to study the earth as a planet. And I study the physical properties of the earth. So that makes it geophysics. And physical properties of the earth are telling us something about the geological evolution. And if you're think about the earth, really what it is, it's chemically differentiated. It's not all the same stuff. It's physically deformed. We have mountains, we have volcanoes, we have plates, we have all sorts of things going on. And the signs of that chemical differentiation and that physical deformation is really, they're captured into the inhomogeneities or the heterogeneities that the earth has on its inside. It's not all the same temperature. It's not all the same stuff. And the physical properties of the earth that are affected by all these differences, well, if I enumerate just three, the speed of mechanical waves, seismic waves, the gravitational field that we observe as we drop apples from trees or fly airplanes or satellites around us, 
and the very shape of the earth itself, the topography. Now, as Haley has mentioned, I am interested in this and also magnetic properties. And so there's all different aspects of geophysics, um, but I'm gonna focus on seismic waves here, mechanical disturbances that are caused by uh, earthquakes. Nevertheless, um, what is topography? It's the shape of the earth. It's the ups and downs relative to a gravitational equipotential, but one look at our own earth, and of course you're seeing the very rich nature of not only what happens on the continent, but also the very, very interesting structure of the ocean basins. And I'll talk a little bit about that later. Um, sense of scale, it's about 4,000 miles in radius, 6,300 kilometers. So topography, gravity, you, uh, quickly discovered that the gravitational acceleration is not uniform. Um, and there are many, many, many departures that here I'm just showing a subset of the scale of departures to see some more detail here. But if we study where precisely the gravitational acceleration of the earth is variable across its surface, once again, it's like you're seeing a subsurface topography and now you're starting to see what goes on a little bit on the inside of the earth at the rim of the big mountain belts at the places where apparently there are interesting things going on. I don't have time to talk about them all, but you can all see from these colors that there is a lot going on. And that is revealed by just measuring how uh, the gravitational acceleration works. And so this indirectly, it's a proxy for density dis uh, disturbances uh, in the subsurface. So the thing you learned in uh, school is, you know, 9.8 meters per second square, that's an average value. And here we're talking about departures that are 10 to the negative fifth, 10 to negative sixth away from it. And they are subtly revealing of what's on the inside. And then finally, seismology in the list of topography, gravity, and seismology. Well, uh, here is a snapshot, is, a, is a, a, a decade or so of earthquake locations. And every dot is a place where an earthquake has happened. And once again, you do not need to be a seismologist to see that it's not uniform. It delineates apparently specific regions of the earth where they are very active. There are places where there are not many at all. Um, and they're of course not all the same size of earthquakes. And if you wanna know what we as geophysicists with global instrumentation can pick up almost anywhere, well, it's about two of these types of earthquakes per day. So you all can get a seismometer now. They're, they're high quality is more expensive, but there is, there is citizen seismology and you will be measuring an earthquake globally at a rate of about one or two per day. None of these necessarily destructive, but all of them sensitive, uh, uh, all of them strong enough, even though these are sometimes only micrometer displacements to be, be picked up by the instrumentation of today, including in your own basement, if you do a minimal uh, installation. Now, oops, um, chemistry, leads to physics. And let's keep it very basic here. How hot is it on the inside of the earth? Temperature and temperature variations. Composition, what is it made of? Is it rock? Is it iron? Is it silicate? Is it this rock or that rock? Is it magma? Is it partially molten? Is it really solid? And those two fundamental properties directly influence density, which we measure with gravity, and they directly does influence the propagation speed of mechanical waves, such as those generated by those earthquakes. So in a nutshell, on the scale of our planet, this is two scale, you're going to have a crust, which is about the thickness of the black line here, there is a big mineralogical division around 400 and another one around 670 kilometers down there, which I have as a thin line. And then when the color changes, that's where the Earth's core is. 
and the light gray is liquid iron alloy, mostly iron. And the solid gray inside is the Earth's inner core, which is um, solid, still made of iron. It's very hot down there, but the pressures are so large that that liquid iron crystallizes. And in fact, this keeps going on because the Earth is losing its heat gradually. And so the inner core of the Earth is growing. And uh, I won't say much about the magnetic field, but you will know perhaps that the churning of this liquid, which is very rapid and very complex, well, it has electrons in a slushing hot liquid of iron. And so that is generating an active geodynamo on the inside of the Earth by which we have a magnetic field. But for today here, we're going to have seismometers which record earthquakes, and we're going to have earthquakes. Those typically happen, I showed you the surface plots, but at depth they happen between about a few kilometers down and a few hundred kilometers down. You do not generate earthquakes deeper in the mantle, you do not generate them deeper in the core. But they're all across our planet, and we try to record as many as we can in order to study the properties of the inside of the Earth. So um, I like to say a child can make an observation that tells us something about our planet. The very fact that earthquakes exist and that we can record them in geometries that are very easy to figure out shows you that the rays emitted by these, the waves, the rays here, they bend down and then they come back up. That's a sign of refraction that the wave speed generally increase with depth. And of course, that's consistent with the pressures increasing and the densities increasing. And so there's chemistry and mineralogy for you. We also quickly, but I'm not showing it in this diagram, observe that if we have earthquakes that the waves travel down and then sometimes reflect back up. And so that's a direct sign that there are sharp material contrasts in the earth. And then finally, uh, you can very quickly deduce that the earth has a fluid outer core because certain type of mechanical waves, the shear waves that simply don't transmit in a fluid. In fact, it's a definition of a fluid. And so just by tracking primary types of waves across the earth, you can tell that the wave speeds increase with depth, that there are strong contrasts, that there are subtle variations, and that there's solid and, 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 and fluid divisions in there. Now, that's 1960s seismology. If it's not earlier, we've known that for a very long time, and you can all verify that if you have access to much of the free data that we academics put out on the web. Fast forward to the way we are doing now computations on wave propagation. This is um, a, a model type, so a modeling um, a capability that has been developed by one of my colleagues here next door, Jeroen Trump. And it, a, a website that exists to date is, is you, you go to Shake Movie and it will show you for every recent global earthquake just exactly how the wave propagation is rippling across the Earth's surface. So here's, of course, you know, uh, your piece of the Pacific Rim, and then there's seismic stations on these things, on the, uh, the triangles. And for a particular earthquake, offshore Oregon, this, I'm, I'm just showing some stills because, you know, movies don't always work in a presentation the way you want to. And you are seeing, now I'm just going to play it forward and backwards a little bit. You're seeing how earthquake waves propagate across the entire globe. And everywhere where there is a color, there is a motion of the earth up or down. And so initially that's about spherical and collapsing back to a point, if you will. And as you go on, you're seeing this rich, rich wave field traveling uh, backwards. And well, it's only forward, but I'm making it go backwards here. Uh, multiple times around the globe. And every time one of those uh, points here, uh, seismograms is of course hit by a different color, that traces out the seismograms. And that's the type of information that we use now. So this uh, animation here is an actual calculation. It's a hard calculation. It's a complex parallel calculation. And it has a lot of realism about the Earth. I'm showing it to you here. 
to show you that that's the type of information that we have available. But we might only have records in these triangle uh, places of stations, and we need to try to figure out from the data what kind of Earth we have in the inside before we can even proceed to making these types of calculations. So um, this is 25 minutes, and now you know it's the other place. So in a nutshell, what every scientist does is compare an observation with a prediction. And here I'm showing you a random seismogram filtered in a visible filter band where blue is an observed record and black is a calculated record. And you can see in this particular examples that that complex wave field leads to little waves and big waves and dispersive waves and refracted and reflected and this and that, all sorts of character. And you're seeing that we know very much about the Earth to the point where we're on a first try matching a lot of the character of this wave field. But we are now, as seismologists, hunting for the little differences. Is it a little fast? Is it a little small? Is it a little slow? Is doesn't it have the right frequency dispersion? So we are trying to find models for the Earth that explain all the details of data like this everywhere. Ultimately, that's the goal. Now, the way to do it is a long story, but essentially it's tomography. It's the way a medical doctor would use an x-ray source to illuminate your body and to have a detector on the other side and then rotate it around. We are using sources of mechanical energy that are earthquakes, and we're trying to capture as many as we can in as many places as we can. And then we are literally doing a tomographic reconstruction, a CAT scan of the earth. And instead of density differences or, or um, absorption differences, like on the left in x-rays, our unknowns are seismic wave speeds, because again, they tell us something about composition and temperature and ultimately about the evolution of our planet. Sounds reasonable and has been done since the 70s. And with increasing sophistication, we have more and more computers, we have more and more stations, we have more and more refined modeling capabilities. And this is the ongoing march of science where we're trying to do this for very specific questions that I'll be talking about. So I don't think necessarily I have to belabor the point of how tomography works, but you have data. One path is shown, and it's a time series, a seismogram, and on the right is unknowns, and you're trying to ask, well, how much is the wave speed different here or there compared to a model? And if I show you a little bit more, where it would be multiple data, covering Australia, for example, and then multiple unknowns telling us something about Australia. And I'm just showing you now a couple of examples of what historically we have been able to do as a science in order to study, say, continental structure. This is an example of what the continent of Australia looks like in cross-section and in a color scale of where particular types of waves called shear waves travel faster than their average over this panel and slower. And if you wanna get used to the color scale, blue in our science is typically the wave travels faster and red is it travels slower and typically hot material slows down the waves and is typically red and dense material, high in certain elements, highly packed in certain ways, is typically um, propagate at seismic waves faster, so that's typically blue. So we look at these pictures and we're asking, Haha, well, how do we link the surface geology? These are ages of formation of crustal features where the crust is not even shown here. I'm already down into the mantle and trying to understand how this continent behaves, how it got to be there, what its structure is. And so we sort of look at this and we go, okay, well, this is the basis for interpretation of a stable continent, Australia. And that, that the term for that is it, it's its lithosphere that we study. Now, here's a second type of processes that are going on in the earth. And those of you afraid of earthquakes know all about it, is that the oceans are widening 
they're shoving pieces of oceanic plates down usually continental pieces. And here is an example in Indonesia and Japan. And the blues, again, are areas where the wave speeds are fast and they are dense. And that's because there are pieces of oceanic lithosphere that are being shoved down inside the Earth in a process called subduction. And that's half of a cycle, a fluid mechanical cycle of what the Earth is doing. And whatever comes down must, or goes down, must come up. And so the, the opposite of subduction down is a, a upwelling circulation that people have hypothesized takes the form of columnar plumes of material that are rising which ultimately when they interact with the surface generate large lava flows, large fields of basalts. Those of you in the Columbia River uh, flood basalts know about these types of rocks. Well, we are wondering where do they come down? Uh, from, uh, from which depths do they come up? And when we look at a picture like this here, this is, a, is at one particular depth and red again is slow wave speed, but I told you slow means less dense and less dense means it's buoyant. And so we are looking at red things as thinking, aha, they have a tendency to rise up and they are potentially uh, showing us uprising things. And take a look at Galapagos, take a look at Hawaii, take a look at you know various features I'll outline here. We are trying to see how and where the geometry is of upwelling parts of a mantle circulation, um, just like we are looking at the downwelling parts and just like we're looking at the stable parts. That's three reasons to want to study the interior of the earth from seismology. Now, there's probably some doctors in the room, medical ones, and if you are doing x-ray tomography or MRI or any other type of medical imaging, you know that you need to illuminate your patient from all sides and you have that control because you can stick them in a tube and rotate your sources around. But at the scale of the problem that we're um, uh, uh, having you know, before our eyes here is we need earthquakes as energy and we don't make earthquakes at this scale. We make them at a smaller scale and sometimes accidentally, but earthquakes just happen. They happen at plate boundaries. And seismic stations, well, they're usually on dry land. Here, the lighter gray colors are where we have multiple stations, and I'll show you another station map. So the source of energy is not uniform and not within our control. And the receivers of energy that we need to do this mapping is where it's convenient, more or less, is where we live. And yes, we can put stations to receive seismic energy on ocean islands. And yes, we can put them on the ocean floor and people do that, but that is hard in both places. Ocean islands are distant, storms are dangerous. The water is deep the pressure is high. So it's just a lot easier to instrument our um, continents. And this is a map of high quality global stations that we have ready data access to. Now, when I started this work and I'm in a department that also does oceanography, of course I looked over the shoulder of my oceanographic colleagues who have access to instruments that measure water properties with a network of thousands of freely floating autonomous instruments that measure things like the conductivity, the depth, temperature of the water. This is a snapshot of a program of oceanography called Argo. That is every dot is an instrument that tells us something about the ocean. And we looked at that 15, 20 years ago almost, and said, we need to build something, even a 10th of that for seismology. Can we build anything resembling this oceanographic work for seismology such that we can cover the ocean with an equivalent station receiver density as we have on land? So we thought we could try it. And we coined the acronym Mobile 
earthquake recording in marine areas by independent divers. Any geoscientists in the room that was at Princeton until about a decade ago might have met Professor Hus Nolet, who was at the start of this project and who came up with this acronym. And I checked in with him yesterday. He's retired, but he's doing well. And he says hi. So what do these instruments need to do? They need to be autonomous. They need to be, one needs to be able to communicate with them. They need to go down to a depth and measure mechanical wave energy that has come from distant earthquakes and traveled through the entire earth and then been converted into pressure in the ocean. And it needs to detect that and it needs to think about if it's an earthquake and not something else. And then it needs to report it and then it might take from us another instruction and then it needs to go back down. And it needs to do that cheaply, reliably, and for a long time. And that's what Mermaid is doing. Now, um, it didn't just magically happen. And I'm gonna skip quickly through the first try where we recorded precisely one useful earthquake, but it was a stellar success because we had that one. We went through a second generation where we changed certain aspects of it to make it better and longer lived and reliable. And we recorded multiple, multiple more earthquakes. We went to the Mediterranean of which you see a picture here. We went to the Indian Ocean. We went to various places. And so we collected seismograms from around the globe, each of which records that you're seeing here is linked to a particular earthquake. And when we know the earthquake, because it's also recorded in other places, we can do this business of trying to figure out how fast the waves traveled, how fast they departed from the average, and what that tells us about how hot the earth is on the inside, because it's not the same temperature everywhere, and what the different uh, heterogeneities of composition are, because they have these upwellings, these downwellings, these stable regions, and so on. I had an offshoot of a project called Sono Mermaid. I'm going to be silent about it because it is not currently active. We had a second version, which was a lot more involved. And now finally we've settled on the third generation mermaid instrument. So that's sort of the star of today's talk. And this is the inside of it. It's a glass sphere that can withstand pressures up to six kilometers, but you can buy uh, uh, even ones that are deeper uh, stable. It has a bladder system that pumps around a hydraulic uh, fluid by which it can adjust its overall effective density. And so it can sink to a target depth. We keep that at about a mile down in the ocean, 1.5 kilometers, and then it can rise up again. The actual hydrophone, which detects the ambient acoustic pressure variations, in other words, the sound underwater, is a little uh, off-the-shelf thing here that is tuned to the frequencies where we know earthquakes are. It communicates once it's above water with us through a satellite constellation called Iridium, and of course it keeps location using GPS, and importantly, it keeps time because it will not have escaped notice that if we know where the earthquakes are, which we do because we have one hundreds of other sensors, and we record them underwater, and we want to say something about the speed of the seismic waves that traveled from the earthquake to the station, we need to keep time very accurately, and we need to keep location very accurately. But there is no GPS location underwater, so we need to do the best we can, surface regularly, making sure that we interpolate things right and keep track of time, because underwater also there is potentially a drift of the clocks, and so we reset the, uh, the time, we, we resynchronize everything, and so there is quite a lot going on, but that's the combination there of Iridium and GPS. And then it's filled with batteries. And this particular instrument lasts for about four years now going. And we're hoping to get another fifth year out of many of them. 
It right now only does a hydrophone, but we have other uh, open ports. And so we are working with oceanographers and climate scientists and meteorologists to figure out what else we could be carrying for them, while now our mission is mostly about capturing earthquakes for studying the interior of the Earth. So I'll show you a few pictures because while I'm usually not a field scientist, usually safely from my office, work on a computer or a piece of paper calculating something, but I felt like I really had to go to Tahiti, not because it's interesting or it's a, a holiday, but because this was our first test. And um, so I went on this one trip a month around Tahiti on a very small ship. It was not a holiday. It was not comfortable. We saw no land for a month. We saw no birds or heard nothing for a month. And it's really kind of an interesting experience to be on a small ocean ship where you're the only scientist and there's 12 crew working just for you. And our only job was 25 minutes a day, not every day even, to put one of these mermaids overboard because they work, they are so easily launched. That's part of the appeal that uh, even I could do it. And so here is a, a, a launch picture and here's another launch picture. So we basically, we hook it up, we lift it, and we toss it overboard. And 10 minutes later, I check on my laptop through satellite if everything is, goes well, and then we say bye. And then a day later, they give us a first sign of life and then they're on their way and they have been doing this for years now. So here's a couple more shots of, of the uh, crew um, on this French ship that we used uh, launching mermaids. So if you are a sailor or a boater or a cruiser and you're seeing something like this, is one of our mermaids. Stay out of the way. Uh, it's not going to bother you. Um, but it's coming up to report four or five earthquakes about six, about every six days now. And it's not time to come up, but it's, that's how many earthquakes there are to report worldwide. Where are they now? If you're going to www.earthscope.org, you'll see this map. It'll be live and you can check our instruments and our partners when they were launched, what their state of health is. If you're a little bit more into seismology itself, you can get some of the data also right there. But otherwise, you'll just have to know that we are in the back uh, treating this data and collecting this for uh, tomography. We have targeted, uh, if you don't know where Tahiti is, it's probably around here at this point. So we are still primarily interested in sampling the structure around Tahiti here in this mantle, but to figure out what's going on with these mantle upwellings or plumes. But we've also had a, a, a beginning uh, array in the South China Sea, and we have some in the Mediterranean, which is not uh, shown on this map. And we have one that was captured by the Filipino Navy, and I'm trying to get it back. Okay, so if you have any connections there, I do have a lead, but I'm going to want my data and hopefully the instrument as well. Because, of course, there is no hiding where it is. This particular mermaid crawled on land, took a highway, and then got gas at a gas station and ended up on a naval base in the, in, the, in the Philippines. And then it was turned off. So I do need to get it back. Um, I, I am going to watch the time here and, and uh, go towards my uh, exit here. So this project, 67 launched, have reported hundreds, thousands of earthquakes, and we are in the business of studying them. Are they well recorded? Are they large? Are they small? Do they show faster or slower waves? We are building this tomographic database. Here is a, a, an image of, you know, the, a couple of them of how they their trajectory has been, what they're doing. So we're publishing now the, as I call it, the boring seismic papers to build a database with which we can do that CAT scanning of the earth. And we have not even started with that because we want as many as we can, and probably about next year, we will be actually doing the, the, the tomographic inversions. Now, so we're collecting, collecting, collecting. But I'm just going to give you two more aspects of this, just to drive the point home why we're looking at this mantle plume upwelling. This picture here of the 
northern half of the Pacific Rim, and you're seeing Hawaii here, the Hawaiian emperor chain, right? So we think in this modeling that island chains like Hawaii are caused by upwellings of hot materials. And it's because there's plate tectonics where the plate rides over the stationary mantle that they just sort of fire volcanoes. And as the plate moves about, the volcanoes die out and the next one is being formed. And the next one after that is coming in a few million years. This thing here, this mantle is complete. This is a cartoon, it's not the scale, it's completely featureless, but you can bet that we wanna know the details of what that is such that we can do simulations, we can do predictions, we can understand this whole system. And I return to the beginning here, how hot, what is it made of? We're gonna measure that, the speed of seismic waves. That's why we're doing that. I'm re reformulating here the methods overall. We've got a source of energy, those are earthquakes. We've got seismometers. These now include mermaid floating seismometers. We have a reference model. We know what's going on since the 50s and 60s on average. And then we're doing some sophisticated forward computation of these uh, waveforms to try and see where the differences lie. And then we're modeling for three-dimensional variations by which to study this whole system of our interior of our Earth. I return to the plume picture to show you roughly where um, our area of focus is here. I'm actually not seeing the Pacific, where it says Pacific super plume. That's where we are now trying to map out these red spots. Um, I'm gonna skip over this. This is somebody else's model that shows you all sorts of complexity. I'll return to the statement of the problem of why we had to build a new instrument is that there's never enough earthquakes for my taste. There is definitely not enough seismometers in the ocean. The images, even though we know a lot, are never good enough. And we want to image that better and better, finer and finer resolution. The same thing that drives technology in medical sciences and non-destructive testing of airplane parts or heart valves or whatever. You want to know everything at this best uh, detail. And we're in Tahiti, not because it's pretty, but because it's there and there was a free ship that we could use to launch all these instruments. I'm going to go a little bit quicker here and I'll zoom in on some known and previous models of Tahiti, which I can point out here. So I've been talking about what's lying underneath, what sort of red upwellings might there be, how do we image them better than this picture, which while interesting and very good, is not the state of the art anymore of the detail that we wish to know about these types of systems. So this was a whole bunch about earthquakes. Polynesia around Tahiti, tomography, we're busy doing that, more to come. Thousands of earthquakes reported, it's going very well. I'm gonna skip over the part where we also recovered one mermaid, which normally isn't meant to be recovered, but we listen continuously. We only report earthquakes, but we have a year long buffer of data that tells us what it also heard that wasn't useful for tomography. And Pete, my graduate student wrote, wrote a very nice paper about the sounds that are happening underwater when there isn't an earthquake which is most of the time. And the story, I'm, it, sadly, you're gonna miss it, but it tells us something about the oceans, right? Right here, quickly, I'll show you that ocean storm systems generate a lot of noise in the ocean, which is not earthquake related, but it tells us, in other words, when we're not listening to earthquake, something about the state of the ocean. And this guy here won a Nobel Prize last year we're figuring stuff like this out in the 60s. And this is an old picture of when he was um, working on the ocean, but then he moved on to other, other things. This is Hasselman. Um, so this type of process, which is not earthquakes, but is nevertheless going on in the earth is called microseisms. And our mermaids are observing this as well. This is due to wave 
heave. And so beyond measuring earthquakes for seismology of the Earth's interior, MERMIT is an environmental sensor that tells us something about the ocean and the weather of the ocean and the, ultimately the temperature of the ocean. But I've skipped over this part of the story. I'm also going to skip over something else that is happening, and that is how we are listening to interactions of these ocean waves with the ocean floor, which is a story that has too much detail. So I'm going to make you want it another time. And then finally, to conclude, I want to show you, look, since we have continuous records for one Earth, for one mermaid that we recovered, and we look at the time series of pressure perturbations, and here is a spectrogram of where the energy is distributed. We noticed that there were several instances where it looks like there was no earthquake, there was no ship, they certainly weren't any whales, but there were these perturbations, these bursts of noise. This is in black is in the time domain. This is pressure as a function of time and the color codes or spectrograms that tell us where the energy is distributed. And there is bursts of activity going on. Now, these are submarine volcanoes that are just randomly going off all over the place. And we hadn't made much of it because it wasn't our part of the story, nor part of the design. And then, of course, Hunga Tonga happened. And if you haven't heard, about that, you um, may have been living under a rock because it was heard everywhere. I have a little barometer on Geo Hall, the geosciences building. And the next day it was in the New York Times and I looked and sure enough, there was a little blip both ways, the direct wave and the wave that had already propagated the longer way around the earth are on almost every barometer on earth. And this is now a burgeoning field of study. But of course we were nearby. Hunga Tonga, Hunga Hapai is in this black diamond. And we'd been building this array to do all sorts of other things, none of which was eruption. But in red here show all, is shown all the mermaids that did hear the Hunga Tonga eruption. And so we have been very busy dialing into our instruments with had been reporting a year of years of earthquakes, but now we went back in the last year to try to get as much of this data back. It's expensive to get something back through a satellite. It's on a mission to catch earthquakes, but we are able to communicate to it and say, please give me another 10 minutes, an hour, two hours. And, 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 and we have now, we're now at the end of this process because it's rolling off the year long buffer. We have collected many, many records of our mermaids that heard this phenomenal eruption heard around the world. And again, I don't wanna bore you with the details, but I'll just show you just the data here. Look at mermaid number 45 in red, relatively nearby. Here next is the time series. So this is on the X axis is, is time. And on the Y axis is how far away it was. And so you're seeing a little pressure seismogram. And so these two here that I've picked out are, they were in the same general direction. They were just distant by a different amount. And so if you're wondering how does this particular ocean pressure wave propagate that was caused by this, this massive eruption underwater, well, I've this is Joel Simon, our postdoc here, who was a grad student, the one from Oregon. He's cut the records in half and showed an up for one and the down for the other. And then he shifted them in time, just to give you a feel for how non-random this sequence is. The volcano did its thing. The wave went all over the place. But if you're looking at two things, it's a coherent propagation of energy that in time shows these different pulses and, and, and this uh, green, uh, red, red and blue is just showing how from one instrument to the next, this is not noise. This is literally the signal of that volcanic eruption. And now we're playing with the details of that and there's much, much more coming here. 
accept. Um, my uh, screen appears to be frozen. Oh, it, it's coming. It's just slow for some reason. So um, I, I need to set myself back into full screen. So that was the last of what Mermaid is hearing. It hears a lot of random volcanic activity. We try to avoid it. It's, it's noise to us, except this one where we really want everything of it. Hunga Tonga was especially well recorded, and it's going to be a really nice paper when we finally have all the data to put that together. And again, this has nothing to do with the interior of the Earth. This is everything to do with one volcano that went off once, but it's an incredibly rich signal and is going to tell us something about the structure of these types of eruptions that we haven't heard before. Data continue to be requested. We're actually just done with that. And uh, let me just wrap up and say, I, I think I skipped over some parts, but the key messages here are land-based seismic arrays of seismometers. They needed oceanic counterparts. And we have built an instrument that records earthquake and it's called Mermaid and it's autonomous, it's floating and it's working very well. There's 55 of them that are still reporting data. The oldest ones have now joined um, Neptune. The project that we call EarthScope Ocean is busy in Polynesia with the specific focus trying to get structure of mantle plumes in this giant upwelling uh, plumbing system that we know is part of the general circulation model of the Earth's mantle where things go down and things come up. And that is why we are specifically around this area of French Polynesia, because there are hundreds of volcanoes there. And so that's a field of warm material that is coming from the deep mantle whose details we want to study. I skipped over the part that Mermaid also records noise, but the noise is not just noise. It tells us something about the ocean. And there is a climate and a meteorological story there. And seismologically, we knew about that noise. We knew and know very well understood the mechanism since the luminaries like Hasselmann and others, whose picture I showed you, figured out the mechanisms by which this type of noise generated another type of noise that we've been studying since the 80s. And there was a story I completely skipped, which is how we also are able to explain other parts of that noise field. And then finally, I've shown you some of the very first records and possibly the only ones you'll ever see of in situ instruments, hydrophones, little microphones underwater that heard 29 of them that heard the detailed eruption sequence of that Hunga Tonga, Tonga, Papai um, eruption, which uh, literally was a volcano heard around the world and which is just so exciting that we are uh, capturing that. So you didn't interrupt me once, but feel free to ask me anything. Can I, uh, Jerry Fish, I wanted to ask if your mermaids are looking at the uh, low shear velocity uh, blobs uh, in the mantle as well and shedding any light on what they are and why they're there and how they're involved in the plumes. Yeah, so ultimately the, um, the, a tomographic image that we should try to reconstruct is looking like it would reach indeed through the entire mantle column by which it could indeed capture the base of the mantle where we have these ultra low velocity zones or the large low shear velocity provinces. As you, I think, know, and the others probably don't, is that those are areas where there might be, um, they might be the source areas of these plumes. And we are interested in figuring out if indeed what we are hopefully about to see how it connects to those things. So those low shear velocity provinces in the deep mantle have been already very mapped out, well mapped out by global seismology of a variety of other uh, types of instruments. But it's that local structure, mostly but in the mantle I above it that has been hard. But yeah, so no, I don't know. Somebody's I think, not on mute. I figured um, they got going on to better things. Yeah, he made enough money for yeah. the sale of this thing yeah. already. 
and they figure that it doesn't cost them so much. Yeah. So I'm watching this. Are you hearing this interference? Zoom meeting. This is a Princeton yeah. professor talking to Princeton people around the Pacific Rim about any better detection. We hear you. Mr. Sutton, hear you. can you please mute your microphone? Oh. Oh, okay. Excuse me. Oops. Thank before you. Before he says anything untoward. Yeah, so so it, it'll be part of the story. We we hope to resolve it, although the deepest part of the mantle, we have a, an aperture of our array that is trying to focus more of the upper part, but it's a crucial part of the story, how well that connects, how how broken up these things are and so on. That's going to fit in there. Dr. Dave Scheibel. Paul, Dave Paul here, just a real quick question. Actually, two of them. Number one, were you concerned that some of the mermaids did not pick up a substantial amount of data from the eruption? Yes. Uh, it, uh, it, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, concerned as in modeling, or rather asking questions and trying to model why that was. You picked yeah. up on something I skipped over there, then we've highlighted them in some instruments yeah. were right nearby. Right and didn't hear anything, and yet they were functioning perfectly well. And so we are developing a theory where we're trying to see how directionally isotropic the energy from the volcano was emitted, oh, sure. how much the fact that it was behind the Tonga-Fiji arc may have occluded some of the signal, and how sometimes it's in, in one direction at different distances, there is departures from, you know, the same signal. In others, it's a complete time shifted copy, the ones I showed you. And then in other cases, the directional variability that does it. So we are, the working theory is that most likely the eruption was directionally isotropic, but it's the interaction of the oceanic pressure wave with the details of the topography that diffracts the waves around it and that uh, thereby shields some mermaids from hearing it and, and others didn't. But we're not there yet. And this is this is a this is what we're looking at because that that's what you picked up and it is as puzzling to us as it is to you. Yeah. The second question is a little bit related, but I'm wondering um the the, the oceanographers are, are just now getting into uh being able to predict uh, the rogue waves by the interaction of more than one wave train. And I thought, um, are you doing that second order and third order dimensional analysis that allows you to maybe predict a, a, a rogue interaction of um, the, the shock waves from, from an earthquake? Uh, that is not something that we have thought about, but now it's going to be in my mind to look it up. It's tempting. The, <laughs> the, uh, the thing that the, the thing I also partially skipped over, but the thing that Hasselman worked out was yeah. the interaction of two opposing uh, waves okay. that set up a, a, a whole ocean oscillation that ultimately couples into the ocean floor. And that we know, oh. love, and hear very well. But oh. um, uh, beyond publishing that paper about that and saying, well, see, we are useful for the environment as well. We are still mostly focusing on the solid earth. Um, but, you know, here we are. And so <laughs> it, it's, it's if we capture more mermaids, which normally will never be recovered, they will send us whatever data we have. But the one that we captured, we got all the data. And mm -hmm. in order to study the questions that you're raising, we would hope to capture more and get more of the continuous data because otherwise it's just the triggered earthquakes that we're getting daily, including today. Thank you very much for a very clear presentation of a very complex, complex uh, concept. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, yes Frederick. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Um, Andy Wilson here. Um, I know they're not designed to do this, but have mermaids picked up uh, gas bubble eruptions from subsurface methane hydrate uh, deposits? Uh, I think that some of the um, uh, um, spectral signatures that we saw, so so what Pete uh, did, Pete Pratanporn is his last name, in the paper he published, he went and looked at all the earthquakes we knew, then he tried to find all the earthquakes we didn't know about, then he talked 
uh, cut out all the uh, uh, known signals like boats and ships and so on. And then he was left with two sets, one of just noise, which he related to the ocean surface. And then there were all these sequences of things that were, I talked and I said, you know, probably eruptive, but it, it must include that sort of other signal as well, because there is a lot of bubbling. There is a lot of things coming on and, and everything makes noise. That is, a, that's a sort of a tagline here, right? Everything moves on earth all the time and everything makes noise. And again, if there is um, that sort of thing, I would not doubt that we would hear it. But we haven't looked and we haven't specifically been able to point at anything like that. But that's another yeah, good point. Dr. Simons, this is Gary Scharf from Portland. Um, I'm not uh, familiar with the technical detail, but this has been fascinating. Thank you so much. I do have a, a, a question, sort of a 10,000 feet up question, which is, I understand that your analysis pertains primarily to energy flows that are generated primarily from within the Earth that move up to the surfaces, and then you're measuring them and the seismic activity and so on. I'm curious whether there's another source of energy, of course, in the whole system of the Earth, which is the heated atmosphere coming from global warming. And I'm wondering if there's anything that your data suggests to us about how the overall Earth system might be affected energetically by the radiation back into the, the seas and the land by the captured heat from uh, CO2 and, and those gases. Yes. So right now, we're focusing on the hydroacoustic right field. But our next model that we're going to get next month, according to the manufacturing uh, place, but everyone is subject to the part shortage and so on. Oh. We are combining our hydroacoustic measurements with a dedicated conductivity temperature and depth measurement. Because as we are all very interested in, in your question, and that is specifically how much of the heat that we know is present and is rising is actually captured in the lower part of the oceans. And so that Argo program that I showed you, the, the 4,000 dots on the map, we have mapped very well as oceanographers, that's not me, what the heat content is of the upper ocean, the heat content of the lower ocean and how that precisely interacts with what you're saying is still largely unknown. And deep Argo is not a huge project and our mermaids and including the, the one model that Princeton will have that is a prototype, that's my next uh, prototype, will be specifically measuring the profile of conductivity temperature and depth down to 4,400 instead of just a mile down. And that is gonna be the start of being able to map that at larger scale. But this is not my time to complain about funding and so on or about time and, and student, but this will take a concerted effort. And we are hoping that by buying this new model and designing it and working with manufacturer and others that we will we'll have in fact three or four because there's some Japanese partners that will show the way for a yet another next generation of instrument to answer questions precisely like the ones you're asking. All the while also recording earthquakes because I don't want to give that up. I'm not going to you know, go back to school. All right, I'm going to jump in here, Professor Simons. We've got, I know we're kind of pushing time, but we've got two people who've had their hand raised. So Eddie, you're them. next, and then Stephanie, and then I think we might have to call it. I think, Eddie, you need to turn in your problem set that I think is a little late. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Frederick, really good to see you. Um, for those who don't really know, I, yeah, Frederick was my professor when I was at Princeton the freshman year, and I think junior or senior year. Uh, which is fantastic. Uh, so two questions for you, I'll keep it short. The first is about mermaid and then the waveforms it picks up. Um, I'm not, so how, I, I guess we gloss over the noise part, but I'm kind of thinking, what what are the sort of telltales of an earthquake wave as apart from other ocean ocean waves that, you know, you would have picked up and I, and how would you tell them apart? Um, that's yeah. something that I, uh, yeah, I'm super curious. 
Um, yeah. So that that's 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 that is ultimately how it started. Because when I had that one instrument and that one earthquake, I had no great success to report. So I worked on the algorithm to distinguish not just an earthquake from other things, but an earthquake from other earthquakes. And so the answer is in the time frequency distribution of mm -hmm. that energy release. And we know we knew roughly what bands to look at, but it, it's literally that time spectral signature. And so all the aspects of denoising, needing to know the signal in order to denoise it come into play. Um, I have I cut it out earlier this afternoon. I figured it'd be too much, but I have whales to show, I have ships to show, I have breaking ice shells, I have little earthquakes, small earthquakes, and they all have classes of energy in time frequency distribution. And so um the stupid thing for me to say would be read the paper, but you know we have worked on that. This is part of our uh, of our concern, and it's it's very intriguing, and it's just also how people distinguish a nuclear test from an earthquake. This is an active field of study. Uh, a jetliner that goes down in the ocean is going to leave a signature, and so we're collecting signatures of things that are happening in the ocean. But clearly, we have a long history with earthquakes. We knew where to look, but yet we designed algorithms to do it because. Our instruments are on a battery, and my first paper on the subject was, how can I do this while spending as little energy as possible? So I was counting operations. We were doing the how many multiplies and adds and buffer overflows and so the rounding can I do and still capture it. And for any of you technically in any of the field that we used a technique uh, of time frequency decomposition is called wavelet analysis, which is also Princeton related because Ingrid Obishi was a big um, inventor of that in the 80s, much before my time, in other words. Thank you. Um, and then we'll keep the second one real quick. How would you rate that Tahiti trip to our 2012 trip to Cyprus? Which one's better? Uh, sorry, the trip to Tahiti, was it better than Cyprus that you Yay. and I went on? Yeah. Well, I told you that I was seasick for 28 days. <laughs> But I felt like a hero. And in Cyprus, um, I don't know if I was a hero, but I was driving you to do work. So um, thank you, Stephanie, sir. I also had her hand up, right? Is that the other hand that we saw? Yeah, yeah. Um, I actually I had some similar questions to Eddie. So it was uh, great that you touched on those. I also had some questions about operationally how things work. So you mentioned that they are battery driven. Um, I know nowadays a lot of sensors like those from sail drone are um, being solar powered or thinking of other ways that you can, you know, have sensors have a longer lifespan than the five years. Um, I was wondering if that was in the plans for your next gen sensors. And then for now, also, I think you said like a five year time horizon. Um, what happens when they're decommissioned? Do they just become... Uh, ocean junk or do you guys uh, collect them in, in big batches? Because I can imagine particularly, um, you mentioned some rather contentious areas geographically where you're working now, like the South China Sea, um, that it would make sense to um, get those back out. Yeah. So first of all, I don't litter. Okay. Good. I'm an environmental engineer. Very, so that We are very concerned question. about this. So <laughs> So this is relevant. The natural state of a mermaid is dead and buoyant, mm -hmm. which means that as they are dying off, we will find them. Ships will find them. We hope to get them back. We cannot rent boats at $80,000 a day to go find them all back. We lost a couple, we've gotten them recovered, but we are now, we're, we're going to see the die off happening because they're entering their fourth and fifth year. So we are part of a UNESCO Law of the Sea protocol for scientific study of the oceans and the end of life is something we take seriously. And so not to mention that I want them back because they have a memory card with a year of continuous data. So I'm kind of hoping that we'll see them. As to power, um, there are people developing chemical uh, battery systems that actually, because as we float up and down, 
they, there is a thermal gradient and there is a battery for that, which gives our instruments in principle a lifetime. However, the cost of that is the, is the cost of our instrument. Yeah. And so we we were on a budget as we all. I'm a postdoc. I I understand being highly sensitive yeah. to budgets. So. <laughs> and then and then the third thing is, could we equip Mermaid with a solar panel? The answer is, you know what? We try to spend as little time as possible on the surface, fifteen yeah. to thirty minutes per surfacing, because it's a weak point. We haven't uh, had any issues, but. It's send some data and go right back down. It's not enough time to charge and it's spent most of its life underwater. But tomorrow I'm going to Puerto Rico and I'm launching something like a sail drone, a thing called Sea Track, which is covered in solar panels. And that is for an entirely different project that is going to map the deep sea floor with the acoustic uh, GNSS type of geodesy. And so, yeah, we are aware of that space and we literally have, I, I will show you another time that we just printed the geosciences logo onto that sea track autonomous vessel. And we're going to the Puerto Rico trench to try for the first time to locate a beacon on the bottom of the ocean to within millimeters Whoa. using this sort of thing. And so we're not there yet, we're, we're getting there, but that thing is covered in solar panels because it spends its life at the surface. Uh, we're gonna have yeah, to bring so you happening. back, have, have another Pacific Rim Club and, and you update us on the Puerto Rico trip. If it works, right? Because, <laughs> well, I'll tell a story of a uh, failure also, hopefully, but um, yeah, we are hoping that this is gonna be the next thing. Awesome, good luck, thank you. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, everyone, for sticking around and Professor Simons for your really interesting talk. I think we really appreciated it and we look forward to round two after your trip. Thank you. All right. And now I'm going to sign us off like any good Princeton meeting where there's more than two of us with the playing of Old Nassau. I hope you all have a wonderful evening or morning and thank you so much for being a part of this. Thank you for organizing. Yes, thank you so much. It's my Thanks. pleasure. This is fun. Yeah, mahalo nui loa. Where is the voice of the